Hey, I'm super excited about my next guest on the Music Money Podcast. Today's guest is Ron Beanstock. Ron is one of the most influential lawyers in the music business with a lifetime of accomplishments in the entertainment industry. Among his many landmark legal wins was a victory against Fender, yes, that Fender, where he represented 17 guitar manufacturers and successfully argued that Fender should not be allowed to have trademark registrations to three very well-known guitar and bass body shapes. Just a few of Ron's music manufacturing clients include Peavy, Guild Guitars, Sadowski Guitars, EMG, DiMarzio, Schechter Guitars, Fishman, Washburn, and many, many other well-known music brands. Ron has represented many artists, including Billy Joel, Joe Satriani, Living Color, Goo Goo Dolls, Simple Plan, Porcupine Tree, Dream Theater, and many, many others. But of course, Ron's favorite client is, you you guessed it, Reverend Barry and the Funk. <laughs> Ron is also an accomplished musician who has performed with various major recording artists. His band, The Suits, appeared on Conan O'Brien and CNBC, and he has performed on bills with many top-tier bands, including Blues Traveler, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers. I could keep going on and on with your bio because you've done so much in this industry, Ron, but I'm sure our listeners would rather hear you talk. So I'm going to break in here and let's get this started. Ron, thanks so much for being here today. How are you doing? My pleasure. Thank you so much. It's always nice to talk to a fellow bass man um, and uh, a luminary bass man, uh, someone who has taken the hardest road there is and uh, developed your own band and do original material. We'll get into that in great detail. So um, my non-hat is off <laughs> to you. Well, I, I actually planned this from the very beginning. When I started the band, I was I had a hat thing because I knew eventually I was, no offense, going to end up with your hairdo, if you could call it that. This, this is a style that most people aspire <laughs> to have, but they just can't. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I I, I know I've got a, this is probably a horrible question to open with, but what's the proper te te terminology? Is it music lawyer or entertainment lawyer? There's probably a lot of people who are going to listen to this that, um, you know, are new artists or they're, they're really just trying to break into the music, uh, the music business. Mm -hmm. And they really don't understand mm -hmm. what is the role of an attorney when it gets in the music business in, in 2021. And it's a question I get asked a lot. I think my relatives didn't know what I did for a living for you know 20 years. Um, so what exactly do you do, Ron? It's not like you're a real lawyer. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, <laughs> there's a couple of issues here. First is, is I'd like to believe that we do something a little bit differently than others. I really, really want to start in the beginning with new artists and have them avoid the initial landmines and mistakes. So I usually consult with my artists do a two to two and a half hour uh, seminar, if you want to call it that. Um, you know what I I'm do. talking about. I, I, I attended the seminar, just you and me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and what a great audience. And um, uh, where we go through the income streams. And I think that's what everybody needs to do. It doesn't matter if this is pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Conceptually, the music business in terms of income streams and royalties have not changed dramatically for you know, 65, 70 years. What has changed is the technology that generates that income or it supplies our music to others. Um, you know, just if you wanna look at it from the, the earliest days, if you have a conversation about mechanical royalties, which nobody knows what that really is, they all, everybody says they do. Um, another point of learning the, the ins and outs of the biz. Mechanical royalties, is, as you know, is based on mechanical piano player roles. That's the concept. Um, so if you start talking about technology from 1908 and 1909, in, and it's 2021, people's heads kind of go, you know, they kind of say, what? And I say, yes, it's the technology that changed, right? We went from mechanical piano player roles to this vaporous, you know, digital stuff, but the income issue hasn't changed, right? It's gone, it's statutory because it was created by statute in 09 and the first copyright, second real copyright act. And it goes up and it's 9.1 cents now and all that good stuff. And I'm not going to do the seminar right now, but it's, if you know that technology has the impact on the delivery of that, but the concepts are the same, you'll get the music business and not make these mistakes. And that's what it's really all about. Organizing yourself, number one, organize, right? Maybe it's the LLC, 
that furnishes your services. And you must affiliate with ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC if you're in the United States. And if you're not, you know, if you're in England, it's PRS. And if you're in France, it's CESEM and Bonjour or Bon Oui. Um, and uh, it's, it's all of those organizational factors. And then once the organizational factors are in, you've got them together and you're, you're, you've got the basics done, then it's getting, how does it apply to me? Right. Everybody likes to think they're very different. It's not necessarily genre uh, specific. It's pretty pan genre. Uh, exceptions may be, you know, classical music where the chances of getting, you know, mechanical income may be different, right? Because it's not yours. But then we represent Richard Daniel Poor, who just won a Grammy, classical composer. You know, right? It's his. So it still it still makes uh, perfect sense. But if you if you do the basics, get the fundamentals, understand the income streams, avoid the pitfalls, landmines, all that you know hy hyperbolic conversations about explosion, um, and then learn all that and take the time to learn it from someone who actually does it for a living, rather than the you know your crazy uncle Frank who was in a band in the seventies who was still telling you to send you know, discs to yourself in the mail and calling it poor man's copyright, to which I have to say, dude, do this. Don't listen to cause. I mean, that's Frank, not true. Right. Oh man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I had the conversation with a young band yesterday morning. They're both, uh, not, they're, they're really two people. in the band. They're both 22. And I had to bring this up. And I said, I think I wrote the first article on this literally 30 Seven or 38 years ago, I wrote my first article on the insanity of poor man's copyright and um, of, of the myth. And yet that hasn't changed. Finding information that is relevant to you as an artist, that is cogent, comprehensive and correct is really hard really hard because most stuff is nonsense on the web mm. you know and i think that's i think that's what you're talking about with an entertainment attorney is someone's going to say let's get started let's get you through all this let's get your career going the one thing i can't tell you what to do is how to write a great song mm. right you got that you don't you know get to with, get with other people who can um, but I can certainly tell you how the publishing works and how to do the splits and how to do your co-writes and your co-pubs. And if there's an admin deal and a co or co-admin deal and all those things, that's my job. Um, maybe introduce you to the a producer, you know, if I'm not in conflict, of course, and produce and then introduce you to other musicians. And, and that's part of the networking process. That's all part of what we do. But um, I think that's the flashy stuff. And I think most people think, what I do and have thought about what I do for the last, you know, goodness, it's going on almost 40 years. Um, they think I hang out at shows and do the whip whippy snippy handshakes with everybody <laughs> and, and say yo a lot. Um, and no, I don't. I don't do that. I show up early before you go on. I have you sign the agreements you need to sign. I take them with me. I go back to the soundboard, say hi to the engine, house engineer I know, and I hang out for the first four songs. I then wave and say, guys, I'm, I'm or guys and gals, I'm going home, and I'm not shy about it, and um, I, that's what I do. I think the, I don't go to the after parties um, unless there's some reason I've gotta be there, but I think the biz requires you to be the serious voice of reason in the room about decisions and how to make a living and how to protect yourself about making a living, not protect yourself with this whole copyright mania, but how to protect yourself in terms of what you do, right? right? How to make, how to preserve income because the only thing at the end of the day I really care about is that you have, you make a good living as a musician at the end of the day. That's really what I care about. And, and you're happy doing it. It would be yeah, great, sure. but um, that you make a good living. And that's, that's uh, again, the long winded version. Well, the vision that I had whenever, when I was 21, moving from Indiana, um, you know, I had my popular band in Indiana, left that and then went off to Dallas, Texas, somehow ended up there. 
uh, got with the band that I thought was going to blow up. This is in the early nineties. You know, everybody's getting record deals. Nirvana's taking off all that kind of stuff. And, and I remember when I first got into that band, you know, of course we made our demos. We're like, man, we got to get these in the hands of the labels. And then we, we got to get these in the hands of music attorneys or whatever they called them at the, at the time. And I was like, what? That was the first time I'd ever heard that concept. Me being a, you know, just as opposed to what my, our manager already thinks, uh, Evansville, Indiana is not all farmland. Um, you know, I've, I've never actually farmed uh, any, anything, but, um, but we were pretty naive when it came to the music business. And that was, so I think, I guess, could you speak to that? There was this, I mean, that was a thing back in the day, right? You used to get lots of demo tapes. Why, why was that? Why would artists do that? All right. So there's a first actual rule about it. So labels wouldn't accept unsolicited material unless it went through the hands of a relationship you know, trusted attorney that they knew. And that's because of liability issues, because there were these crazy lawsuits about people who said, I sent you my demo. And then, you know, now this guy's playing my music. Okay. All right. So that's the first reason. And, and, and quite frankly, knowing all the business affairs people at the labels, um, yeah, that stuff happened, and I wouldn't want to be on their side of trying to explain to a person who says that person stole all my music. So that's pro that's number one. Number two, it is how it's done is so difficult. Um, when I first opened my office up in New York, 1987, I, I had been general counsel for uh, Ibanez and Tama, and I, I was yes, I was young. Uh, for, for that position of responsibility. But um, when I left to open up my own office in 87, um, which I literally opened up, by the way, in my apartment in the city. Um, so it was my office, my studio, um, and my home in a studio um, in, in the city. Um, when I first did that, I met a couple, I, I immediately just came into kind of going back from people I knew from playing for a living, and it was producers and studios. and you know, fairly quickly, people would say, you should check this band out or this band would then bring me a cassette oh, okay. <laughs> um, in the day, or they would have independent vinyl out at the time, really popular late eighties, right? New York hardcore scene was, was filled oh, with yeah. that. And um, you, you have to size up what you got, right? You had to size it up. And, and this was hard. Not everybody sized up anything. Some people said, whatever you give me, I'm going to go shop. Pay me to do it. I, I never mm. worked that way. And so in the late 80s, there'd be, uh, you'd get something and you'd say, I get it. I understand. And then you'd have to know the labels and the A&R people. And you'd have to know their tastes. And, you know, you don't send this to that person. That's disastrous. All right. And so and then because then it's all it's it's your reputation. And I think that most bands didn't get that is that when you are shopping material, as much as they think their genius is leading the way, it it's your reputation. It's you, you as the lawyer, your reputation to business affairs and A&R about delivering quality material to them. It may not be their, yes, cup of mm -hmm. tea, but it may be something they're interested in or not maybe them, but the next person in the company. And those are the relationships you foster. And that's really being the music business lawyer. Um, and we just got lucky. I think I, I found three or four bands. I got them very quickly. These first three or four bands, major record deals. I moved my, I moved to an office on 57th street within the year. And we were, we were rolling along little did I know that, um, uh, and I wasn't being naive. Uh, I'm from the Bronx, so I'm skeptical of everything. But uh, little did I know that that people don't play fair, that other law firms are going to try to steal all your clients. You know, you've done all the work and then they're going to kind of come in and go, hey, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Um, little known dark secret of the business. No one will ever know. But um, you start and you have to be able to know where the trends are. Um, late 80s, everybody had, you know, uh, long hair. And if he didn't have long hair, I felt terrible for the guys who have my haircut now. Right. Cause they had to wear, they had to wear these things and it was awful for them. And the era was really tough on certain people. Um, but you know, then that, then that trend kind of 
literally just poofed one yeah. day, it became sort of, it ended and um, the, the, era, the era of guitar solo was over. And, um, and you mentioned Nirvana, grunge swept out with it, producers and engineers, like it was like, yeah. they're gone, they're in. And everybody had a, a flight to the Northwest, literally on Northwest Airlines. This is not an exaggeration. Every A&R person left on a Thursday to go out to Seattle and Portland and would sign bands in rehearsal studios wow. and who had never played a gig and had like one song. And I'm on, I'm thinking, what? Yeah. You, you did a three, a three firm, meaning three, you guarantee three, three records, a three firm deal for 1.5 million for that. Wow. I, I got that demo. They're not that good. <laughs> and, and then there'd be that band would go poof and there goes your, the budget and then they can't sign anything. And you, 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 you then you, you, you focus also on bands that had developed their careers. There were things were going on. You'd find a band and you'd say, I think these guys have got it, guys and gals, whatever, right? they've got it. And you then have to really, you know, make really big business decisions. If they're on an independent, can you move them from the independent to a major, you know, you do the override, you do the buyouts without crushing them with recoupable debt. And, and how do you structure those deals creatively so the bands survive it? Um, that became that's 80s into 90s and then by 95 we had another whole sweep of of acts where we had a kind of almost returned like the goo goo dolls are anomalous because they were on metal yeah. blade and uh, and i know that seems to have always bothered johnny resnick but i'll say it again here on this but for metal blade man you have no career um but um you know, we had this sort of power pop kind of thing come in. And I had this great band I loved from the New York area called Mach 5. And they were sort of at this turning point. And then 95, 96, you had this literal, I shouldn't say implosion. You had this corporate series of takeovers where large corporations came in, seeing billions in the music business and bought these companies up. Sony had already bought, you know, Columbia and Epic. But now you had Vivendi come in and buy Polygram and, you know, which became the universal group. And, and if you weren't prepared and you couldn't always be prepared, if you had had seven acts or eight acts on a label and then this takeover occurs and the president gets fired, yeah, you're doomed. You're doomed. Wow. You're literally doomed. And you can't prepare for that. And even contractually, you do your best to prepare for it, to try to get your masters back and, you know, resume control of your lives. But most bands never recover from losing a major record deal. It was, if you did, you were an exception. And that's the first things you needed to have known. And there's no school for this. There's no, yeah. you know, educational seminar for this. It's, you, you're going to have to have a little bit of street smarts. And you're going to have to have a, a feel for the material and you're going to have to have a, 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 a God, I hate to say, just vibe for what you can do. Then you have to make the deals. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's a combination of all these things. And that's what the music business started to become and changed and morphed. And by the time you're talking about the mid nineties to the 2000 period, the boy and girl bands popped in. Okay. And throughout this entire period is the change in the whole industry with hip hop and rap, which was shunned and pushed aside. Only Relativity Records really wanted to deal with it. And, and I had I don't know, 12 acts or 14 acts on that label at some point. Um, we moved them to various things, various labels. But, you know, hip hop and, and, and everything changed and the sampling litigation that I was involved with at the time. And these are technology issues. But. Music taste changed. Some people couldn't change with them and they stayed where they were and they spiraled into oblivion. Some of them, right? Couldn't make a change. You know, David Bowie and reinvented himself, I don't know, six times, you know, and, and each time managed to keep going. And um, I think that's part of what the process was. But, you know, sort of dropping this portion of the conversation off, 
at 2000 was that's a pivotal era change because CDs started to look like they're coming to an end. And you better be prepared for the delivery system. And if CDs come to an end and people won't pay for music, as, as the 2000s went on, it became very apparent that around 2009 and 2010, people weren't going to pay for music, right? We'd already been through the Napster issues, right? Which was, you know, or presaging the music business would destroy itself. That's not entirely true. But what really happened was technology changed. And if you weren't prepared for that technology change, the ability to download music to each other, share files, um, you were going to get pushed aside. And you had to anticipate knowing uh, what the technological changes were going to be. So if you were in a recording studio all the time, right, if you came in and it was a Studer and a Neve, and all of a sudden it's no longer a Studer and a Neve, now it's this digital board with flying faders, and all of a sudden that's changing. And, you know, think of your first recording. What was it probably a, a yeah, board studio? Track, yeah, 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 exactly. My, I, I know, I know. I had that Tascam reel to reel mm-hmm. board studio. I did all my sports music of the day, which I don't even have in my bio because I don't write my bio. But um, I did a lot of sports music, which was a ton of fun. You know, after the after the day is over, you're doing sports music at two in the morning, um, and uh, it's good to be able to represent yourself. You know, in a matter involving publishing and music, but uh, and the owning the masters. But this is how the music business, you know, morphed and changed. And some people couldn't make the transition. Some people could. Your job as the, as the music business lawyer is to, you know, kind of like a miner with a little light on yeah. to be able to go down the, 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 the path and lead them down there and say, don't, no, no, don't go over there. No, that's yeah. not good. No, that's not good. And it, some people followed, some people didn't. Um, and that ends us up at like 2010. And so to get us to 2021, it's really interesting to talk to somebody entering the music business now because they may not know any of the history. I just bored the whole audience to tears with just now, but um, they might not know any of that. And it's almost imperative that you do because you kind of have to know how you got here. Um, And if you're entering the business now, it's everything that came before the shopping and all that is sort of, you know, tiny little portion of what we would do now. What is much more important is how do you appeal and keep a fan Mm -hmm. base and does social media, the giant, you know, now 1800 pound gorilla in the room at all times. um, How does that work? And some people never made that transition. And some people not only um, embraced it and endorsed it, but they made their careers with it. For sure. And, that's tw- that gets you to 2021. So it's knowing what came before, knowing that the business structure hasn't changed dramatically, but knowing that the technology has and um, knowing that, uh, and here comes the dark side, um, the music business has um, a side to it that is a little on the dark. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there, there are hustlers in our business who will gladly take your money. Um, and they're everywhere. You know, tax consultants, my favorite. Um, yes, my f- tax consultants. Um, not a CPA, a tax consultant. Okay. Though. And these are the things you've got to know. So if you are not, um, if you're coming from Indiana to Texas and uh, everything's been smooth and okay, and then you move you know, that, then it goes to LA. That's actually what happened. I moved to LA right after Dallas. Yeah. And that was, that was a rude awakening. Yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. I mean, boy, when I lived in LA, um, uh, everybody was moving there to, to get a record deal. And that doesn't mean that, and here comes the sad part. Talent isn't always what it is in the music business. Like we all like to think it's talent. Um, but it's not always. It's, it's a lot of right place, right time. And, and LA, you know, the band I was in uh, was a sort of power poppy band with some great harmonies and some really great songs. And then, you know, metal was like sweeping through at the time. 
So here we were with vests and pins uh, and, uh, you know, you could just hear the wind going, yeah. you yeah. know, sorry, yeah. we, we don't have room for you here. And, um, you know, before you knew it, there were bands like Guns N' Roses who took a few years to kind of get onto the, you know, the top of the mountain. But, and you know, sort of we had a return to sort of hard rock bands, but we um, you, you had that was all early, you know, 90s. And again, grunge swept everybody yeah, out. It did. And if you lived in L.A. and were looking to get a record deal and it's 1992. Yeah, it's awfully quiet for you. Speaking of which, okay, so let's let's fast forward ahead to, to the present day for for young artists that are, you know, where do major labels stand? At least in your mind, you've you've kind of hinted in conversations I've had with you at some of the deals that you've seen that have been on the table, and <laughs> they haven't been too great. No, not too great. Um, <laughs> so. It, it sort of proffers the whole question, why, right? Why do you want a major record deal? It's a question I think I've asked a lot in the last 10 years. Why? What, what is it? Um, pop and hip hop, just look at the Grammys, mm -hmm. right? It answers itself. Um, pop and hip hop, yeah, you still not probably need that major record deal for the promotional side and the delivery, you know, out there. But um, social media gives you and, and the the certain fact that you don't have to even make physical product anymore. Mm -hmm. Remember, there was a day that you had to go, if you wanted to go on your own, that you made, you know, you printed out 20,000 CDs. All those businesses went poof, by the way. Um, but if you, um, I should say all, most. So the question that really is the key is why? Mm -hmm. What are the... You know, and there was always this theory that people had, like labels are the imprintor of success. And I used to analyze that really differently. Sometimes I would say, you want a major record deal to what? Get even with your English teacher in high school, your gym teacher, your parents. You know, I made it. I arrived. I have a major record deal. They can't, you know, I, we love Bruce Springsteen, but the lyrics of that song will haunt me forever. You know, um, you know, just got my big advance. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He should have said, I just got my big recoupable advance. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I, for, so for 2021, why do you need that? Why is it imperative? Can you get your, yourself started uh, and create a following of your own using social media um, and just having the luck of the draw of a great series of songs that people latch onto, which is, that's the, the magic. That's my, that's the hand, the zoom hand quotes. And can't answer that part of it. I can do all the others. And so 2021 is knowing that if you are establishing yourself, everybody will come find you. There's no, I don't think anybody's really discovered anymore. You know, people know. Yeah, that, that was the thing. You know, when I was in the band in the 90s, it was all, everything we did revolved around being discovered by somebody mm -hmm. and you know maybe mm -hmm. it was a music attorney maybe it was the, that a and r guy that was supposed to show up at that club that night you know that you know that because because dallas had a scene you know it uh, remember the toadies they were uh, you know they yeah. still had a, a song that's on the radio to this day where i remember opening for them you know you had if you got a great slot before the toadies maybe some guy from interscope was going to come in as well and and watch your band never happened but you know hey you know it, but that's that's what everything was about. I mean, we did have a fan base and we were interested in certainly developing that and playing and eventually headlining our own shows. But it was all about if we didn't get discovered, then we have failed. That's that was our mindset. And, and I felt mm -hmm. like at the end of our three year stint or whatever we did, I really did. I felt like, well, that whole experience was a failure. You know, because because we didn't get discovered. I, I couldn't get like, you know, sure. I have some fond memories of it. It wasn't like, oh, it was a bad time. It wasn't a bad time. It was a lot of fun. And we did have some great shows. And I can I've, I've actually kind of stumbled on a few of them on YouTube. And back when I had long flowing hair that I would thrash about, um, <laughs> you know, but but still, I don't look upon that time as being like, hey, we put out some great music, we had some great fans, and we had a great experience. It was it was just a failure. 
you know, and so now, like you said, so this whole idea of being discovered, you don't need that. What you really need, well, you do need to be discovered by people who actually like your music. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you brought up what I would refer to as the expiration date phenomenon. That if I haven't made it by X, then uh, my on sale date has passed. I need to move on and do something else. Um, and that is a phenomenon has existed. There are bands, again, my ubiquitous use of bands, but that just for any artist who literally will say, if nothing happens in this one year, um, I, I can't, I'm going to go do something else. Um, you know, I've had plenty of artists who didn't quote, make it, whatever that means to someone is very different from another. Um, I was always, like I said before, making a living as a musician is the ultimate goal. If you want to be famous, that's another mm -hmm. thing entirely. Um, and be wary of that, that motive. Um, you know, but the idea that you are, you, if, if five years in, you haven't done X, Y, and Z, then you give it up and go on to something else is something I've always found to be rather sort of a specious kind of comment about how we should be. Um, I believe that particularly bands are the sum of the parts. I fought to the bitter end, not the, not the place to play, the literal expression. Um, having showcased a lot of bands at the bitter end with, he's now passed on, but my good friend Kenny Gorka would just get me anything I asked at any time as a favor. If I said, I got this band in town, this is absolutely true. I got this band in town from um, Iceland. This is absolutely what happened. And I said, I need to get them on on a, on a Friday at like eight o'clock. Can you do it? And he said, um, okay, counselor, you're on. And I brought this band in. I got them a record deal. I had two weeks to get them a deal before they had to leave the country. And I did it on a Friday, did the deal. People use this expression, but it's true. I did this one on a napkin with the A&R uh, guy at, at, at a, at a place around the corner and sure enough we went ahead and made this record um the band is called deep jimmy and the zep creams you could still find their album it didn't happen i'm sorry it didn't happen i'm still occasionally here you know getting an email from them they're still big as musicians in iceland but um it's one of those stories that hey they had two weeks to do it but they had been playing in iceland yeah. for years yeah. and um you know, they weren't going to give up and they had come here <laughs> with, with all, you know, with nothing left in their pockets uh, to get a record, try to get a record deal. Uh, I don't know if that is capable of being repeated again. Um, I think those days are over. I think now it's um, artist has, you know, 1 million YouTube views and artist has, um, you know, 16 million downloads, uh, I should say streams, which by the way, is not a lot of money. Right. Um, and, a one, and 1 million downloads though means something. Cause now, now you, you know, you, if you put that into a times 10, that's a hundred thousand albums you've sold independently on your own, you're in business. Then I, then I get involved and say, Are you sure you want a record? Deal? Right. You sold a hundred thousand records. You really, what you want is a distribution deal it's getting tougher to come mm -hmm. by, by yeah. the way, <laughs> really tough. Um, and you really want promotion. And if the deal is a license deal with a label, okay, we'll look at that. But if it's the 360 deal, that is the common fairly across the board offering with majors in 2021, um, and people won't know what I mean by that, but if you take the four basic income streams in the music biz, that means a label's participating in your live income, your merchandise income, They're, they want to want to be your publisher and they've already got the record side. That's your four basic income streams. You got to think about that because they're taking money from these four different spots and you've got, and you have a manager, 15 or 20% of your negotiated deal, whatever that may be, adjusted gross. Plus you have an agent. So, and maybe a business manager at five percent too. So you, you, these are things you really can have to conceptualize at twenty twenty one. What's the fiscal value of the major record deal? And without in any way, shape, or form denigrating any of my pals at major labels, they would probably tell you my first reaction is to steer you away 
unless it's just, that's a great decision. Let's go with that deal. And sometimes we do, but I don't know in 2021, if you need that the way you needed that outside of pop and hip hop and modern R and B, whatever that's full, but whatever that those constructs are today, because I think they just keep moving around. But um, if you're a band and you have the ability to have a great live, you have a great live show and you have the ability to sell some product, you may make a much better living not having that major record deal. Where do you think the independent labels fall in? Interesting. Um, the, even the independent labels want to do 360 deals. So structurally, they're not that different. Where they fall in is that they are very, very uh, segmented into what they deliver to the to the, uh, the, the consumer. You know, in, in the day, this is a many decades ago, but um, Electra would have been a place you went for no pun here, but eclectic music. Right? They had this band, and, and if an Electra put a record out, you went, hmm, must be cool. Right. Must be cool. It's like early Warner Brothers, you know, uh, or Mo and Lenny ran Austin, uh, the Austin guy, guy. When they ran Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers had these records that were like sampler records of things that they wanted to release and wanted to get people's reaction. They had these sampler vinyl albums and they put these things out and, you know, they had little like score sheets in them and they'd ask you to mail things in. Did you <laughs> like this? Did you like that? And which we don't do anymore because we don't need to right now. We have like or not like instantaneously on yeah, social media. Sure. So, you know, independents have their purpose. Um, I, I do bristle up at certain jazz oriented deals when they say you've paid for the masters. Okay. We're going to own them. If you do this deal with us. Yes. Yes. I don't even have the stroke, but I'm doing my best. Um, and, you know, yep, those are deals I kind of go, this isn't something that's worth doing, perhaps. But people still feel they want the validation of a deal. So they'll take it. They'll take it from the major. They'll take it from the indie. They'll go all the way in, sometimes not knowing what the deal even was. And sorry to say that there are less and less music business lawyers who have that experience because there are so few deals that, you know, as, as I had a conversation recently with an attorney uh, who told me that um, I shouldn't say he, she, they, because uh, they'll know who they are, but um, that said, yeah, they, they just did their first record deal. Wow. Yeah. That's what I said. Wow. <laughs> so I, I think I love that word because you hit the nail on the head validation. There's so much, the, the idea that some major company that maybe somebody has heard of a name like Sony or something like that is now associated with you as an artist or your band. It's, you feel like I, I've arrived, you know, and I've, I've heard bands that did get deals back in the day that, that said like one of my favorite bands of all time is King's X. You know, they, they said they thought that, you know, they had arrived and that what they didn't realize is that the real work began once they got the deal, um, you know, and, and so, okay. So we've covered major labels, independent labels, pretty much made the case that you don't, unless you're major pop fodder or, or hip hop, you don't probably need to go that direction. Um, so I, I had written down a ton of questions. Um, what do you what do you really think of Spotify? Because man, I am I'm in a bunch of music uh, marketing forums and that kind of thing. It's really my uh, my thing. It's, there's like this total focus on that platform right now. It seems like for so many people. But would you feel that that's healthy? What do you what do you what do you see? It's funny you should say that because I was doing an analytic. Uh, some analytics for clients this morning before I got on with you on Spotify. All right. I've got all their info. I even have um, uh, the band I, I play in. All right. Shameless plug uh, band. I play in rich Chalanda and flying dreams. We have two albums out. Um, they are through Sony, the orchard. Um, 
Uh, they've been out for a little bit because we haven't recorded anything this year. But um, I look at our own analytics and, you know, Spotify is the chief methodology to knowing how you're doing both domestically and internationally. Spotify has um, a place. It's re it's replaced, if you will. Its placement is replacing um, what used to be the guest work, right? We now know by analytics who week by week, if not even every two days, who is listening to our music and where. Mm -hmm and what tracks they're listening to. Um, I don't know if you can respond to knowing that, that you have a fan base now in Turkey. Uh, you can respond instantaneously to, to figure out a way to make that work. But, you know, it seems like Spotify, Facebook, Instagram, all sort of come together in a way to, to tell your fan that's listening on Spotify, I have a new product out here, Facebook and Instagram, go listen to it here. Every 1,500 streams is about five bucks. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're uh, doing really well on Spotify, you're probably still not making any real money. I, I think Spotify is an interesting economic phenomena. It's got a market cap in the billions, but doesn't earn anybody any money. Mm -hmm. It's co-owned by a couple of the majors. Yeah. Um, that's Spotify and, uh, you are either going to get people, here comes the hard one. They're either going to download your music on a, so they have it permanently or they're going to stream. Sometimes they do a little bit of the download and stream. If they're streaming, we have to adjust to find a way to make a living because our streaming numbers have to be in the hundreds of millions to support us in the way we were supported when we got mechanical income from the sales of records. And that's gone. Um, so I know the major labels have had banner years saying that streaming has saved them. I don't know if that's because we just had this insanity of a pandemic for a year when everybody was listening to music, but um, it certainly didn't hurt them. But Spotify, sooner or later, will there'll be a competitor. It has not happened yet. Um, Apple hasn't taken it away and Amazon and no one's got it, you know, taking it away yet. But there'll be another way we deliver music to each other. But as of around 2007, 2008, 2009, the era of when people bought outside of vinyl, I know someone's about to say, we need to mention vinyl. Um, Outside of vinyl, we're probably never going to go back to delivering music in a fixed form physical product. We're not even making cars with CD players anymore. Sure. So we we probably have, have to come up with something else. And maybe, and I've been discussing this for years, maybe it's holograms. All right? Maybe it is. Maybe it's the concert in a hologram, holographic form. Uh, you take your little whatever this is and you go, there it is. I can show it on the wall. There's, you know, there's uh, Reverend Barry and the Funk uh, from one of their favorite shows. There you go. What do you think of that? That may be it way, the way it goes. Um, but, and all those rights attendant to what I just did over here are all the same. Yeah. They'll be a little bit more sophisticated in terms of your copyright issues, but that may be the future. But um, ultimately, Spotify represents the, the sea change, another overused phrase, sea change of um, where people find their music, listen to their music. I think statistically, Spotify gets, I could be wrong here, but I think it's 20,000 new compositions Every sent day. up. And I know they're trying to, to keep that to a, to a limit. I know that the Orchard... Uh, as discussions I've had with you and others, the orchard now has become very AR driven, right? They're getting picky. They want to see how the people who bring the, that material in, it's just like the old days. I want, I want to make money from this, right? Will, will Sony make money from this? Do I want to bring in these things instead of the way it was a few years ago? It was eh, everybody's on, everybody's in. There was a time with relativity when relativity 
you know, red, I should say, when it was became relativity to red, when red was running the orchard and versus the orchard kind of getting involved and red kind of all buying into it with each other, red was running it. And um, the theory was we still had physical product to sell. And so, you know, it was on red side. And all of a sudden they bought Spotify, uh, they, they bought the orchard and the orchard became Oh, all these people with the orchard, it's the bigger entity. And so it all kind of subsumed these things. And now the orchard's saying, if you will, like like other distributors, we can't have everything. Yeah. We can't bring everything in. That that brings to mind. I, I for the for the listeners who don't really understand what the orchard is. Um, I mean, there's a, probably a lot of listeners that I think that probably understand what somebody something like CD Baby or TuneCore or distro kid where you could basically just upload your music and in a few days, boom, it's all over the, the interwebs, mm-hmm. if you will. But what is the orchard and what makes them different? And I know a wall is another one that I've heard thrown around a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And you're actually with an artist that's on the orchard. I mean, what's, what's the difference there? So digital, digital platforms are, if you will, somewhat, uh, there's an equality, if you will. Once you're in, once you're on these digital platforms for the number of places that it can be sent out, and if anybody is unsure, if you start out with, um, let's say, let's just start with the Orchard distributing you through, you know, it's Deezer and it's Spotify and it's Amazon. The list is like 30. Yeah. Once you're once you've entered into this as a digital platform, uh, it, it balances out. You're in. Question is, who finds it? Who's going to listen to it? Who's going to buy it? Right? Um, is the next issue. So the orchard is amongst the two or three in my mind top places to distribute your digital product as well. Now they have red, so they can do the physical product as well. Um, but the orchard is often kind of misunderstood in that the difference with the orchard is. Sometimes the analytics, sometimes it's the ability to, to get music into places maybe some of the other smaller digital distributors don't go to. Maybe that list wasn't 30, maybe the list is 20. But once you're in, you're in. And if you're making, you know, if your check from DistroKid or uh, CD Baby is, you know, a buck and a half every quarter, you, nobody's listening, nobody's streaming. And you know, if you're getting $100, you're doing okay, do the math. That means 50,000 people, you know, 75,000 people streamed, you know, in that period. Um, that sounds great. Or they 75,000 streams occurred. Maybe it was the same, you know, 300 people. But the orchard is going to let you know the numbers, the geographics, the ages, uh, gender. I mean, it's amazing. And um, it's a tool in distribution to guide yourself with your releases and getting to people in a very specific way that could never have been known before. And so it it has its great purpose, but someone's gonna catch up one of these days and there'll be a competitor and then there'll be the war about who gets the, you know, the catalogs again, you know, the Beatles stayed out of Spotify I had a client stay out of Spotify up until about three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. Didn't want to do it, right? He used to say, I'm, you know, management would say specifically, I'm not giving our music away. And, and my response was, it already is. Yeah, sure. sure. I mean, I kind of look at it like you do have the opportunity for the world to find you instantly. I mean, a lot of people have Spotify and a whole bunch of other people. Actually, YouTube is a, is a huge platform for people just going on there and listening to music, finding playlists. Apple Music is certainly the same way because a ton of people have iPhones and it's just easier for them to have Apple Music. So I see it as a way of, you know, because it is the idea of this podcast. It's, it's a music money podcast. It's like, where's the money? Show me the money. Um, you know, and, and we pretty much all know it's it's not on Spotify or if it is, it's millions and millions and millions of streams, not just, you know, Mm -hmm. so, but it still is a cool thing where people can, can discover you there. I see that then that if they're interested in what you're doing, that they're going to find you elsewhere. 
you know, uh, if your marketing is good, you're going to direct them elsewhere. You're going to direct them to the socials uh, where it's not just sell, sell, sell. It's, you know, now it's some, oh, I was listening to a music guru, a guru type guy. He said, the most important word when you're th thinking about this is we, it's like, you're building this community, like, especially with Reverend Barry and the funk, you know, the people who like our music are typically, they like the fact that we all play actual real, real quote unquote instruments. And we really sing, we don't use auto tune. It's like, yes. And our music has sort of that, that old school seventies kind of vibe about it. Um, but that's who they are, you know? And so we, as that, that funk community or Reverend Barry and the funk community, they could be part of something, you know? And, and so maybe mm -hmm. if we could take them off of Spotify and, and get them to our socials, our website, that kind of thing, you know, Again, I want to sell them something. We have a, we have a shocking number of people that buy CDs from us, but I think that's because they're still the guys that do have CD players in their cars. Right, <laughs> you exactly. know, I still have the big CD changer. We have one guy bragged upon the fact that he had one of those hundred CD changers. Okay, I, I sell a ton of CDs, and I actually still I don't actually even own one uh, a CD player. <laughs> but um, you know, so I'm still looking for ways to, to monetize that audience. Of course, live performance is a big one with us because, you know, I mean, a lot of big thing about our band is we're live performers. Um, mm -hmm. But I think everyone just has to take their own path, um, you know, and that's the path we're on. I'm still trying to figure it out every single day. So it's it's never going to be easy. And, and there's always there's, you know, the idea of overnight success doesn't exist. It never existed. Bands that say, look, it, it, you know, it, we, we just got instantaneously. No, nobody has just come into a scene and moved on. You know, um, take your pick. Talk about, you know, the Beatles and, you know, their apprenticeship playing, you know, cavern clubs and playing covers and then learning how to play covers um, and then learning how to harmonize with no monitors and you know, all these different things that are part of the apprenticeship. Um, these are things that are decades old. And there's no answer to anything except that there's no overnight success, um, despite any story that people love to tell you. Um, there used to be the uh, the joke we had that the rock five year rule that if you you know if you're 30 you say you're 25, um, you, you know just all of that was so absurd, mm -hmm. you know, and should be absurd because uh, it gets back to the expiration date. You know, it's somewhere stamped on the side of your neck. It says, you know, must make it by this date or please dispose of. Um, it's it's ridiculous. And you you have to have that period where a band like yours, which is, in, in, in my view, relatively unique in that you play material that presages all these other sort of newer versions of this. You went back, took it, modified it, made it your own do it so well live because to me, that's always been the thing. And this is where I'm going to get a lot of yelling at. So get ready. Um, whenever somebody would say, tell me this is going on forever for me, somebody would say, I, you know, what, what do you want from us? I would say, get me, get me your best live performance. Mm. And, and, Inevitably, that's how I'm sorry, I'm now being very judgmental. That's how I would judge. Someone would get me a live performance and I would, and, and you know, this is the oldest discussion I've had. They'll say, what do you think? Well, number one, if you're 16 years old, it doesn't matter what I think. I'm, I'm not your audience, yeah, yeah. right? I can tell you what's a great song or bad song, well recorded. I'm going to make the deals. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be your guy. But that's not necessarily am I relating to the song. But they'll say, what do you think? And I would say, you know, not ready for prime time, mm. right? Some people have it at 16. Some people don't. You need time. And there is going to be that moment. Again, I'm going to get yelled at. You're going to let me know. But I think if you want a, a career used in the four income streams, not just a, if you want to be a songwriter, this is fantastic. Right. That's OK. I'm good with that. You want to be a producer and songwriter. This is great. But if you're going to be an artist and you're going to perform live, you got to have something. You got to have it. You got to have the charisma. You got to. And then here it is. You got to have the song. Yeah, for sure. My philosophy is 
great song played the just play with the most you know charismatic version of yourselves recorded in the best way you can will always win you will always win that's why you're selling cds because you those are the three things you got the three things the people who would like to have the three things may not have one of those they might not be very good live i'm going to get yelled at so but they may not be very good live it's okay not everybody is meant to draw you know, 5,000 people to a venue, you know, um, all right. If you have explosions and you split, you spit blood and, you know, you know, animals run across the stage, that's great for a tour or two, but you got to have a song and you got to have something up there. And, um, the song, yeah, the craft of the song, it's what we do. It could be two chords. Uh, I'll argue with anybody. Why do you think Bob Dylan's deal he's doing now is like a half a million, half a billion dollars? Because Bob Dylan could write these great three, four chord songs and people would say, oh, I could do that. No, you can't. And if you can, let's, let's see it and hear it. But it's not just the chord structure, whether he used a G7 or not, or, you know, or how sophisticated it was or unsophisticated it was. It was, it's the lyrics People would always laugh at me when I'd say Bob Dylan has melodies in his song and they would go, no, he doesn't. I said, of course he does. <laughs> yeah. They don't have to be complex melodies, but you remember those songs. Sure. And songs are the intangible. They're the intangible. Mm -hmm. Sly and the Family Stone. You know, just someone the other day wrote to me and they said, favorite bands that don't get enough attention, you know, and I said, Part of my top of my list is Sly and the Family Stone. They're a whole generation of people who don't know them. And they are the they were the trendsetters for so many different things, you know. Um, you know, non non-gender based and 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 non, you know, uh, uh, in terms of integration. Yeah, um, absolutely. What, a, what what amazing things. And then let's toss in like 15 amazing songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, in, some people are lucky in different fun. genres. I mean, because they, Completely. I mean, they were they were deep in the funk, but some of their biggest hits were basically pop songs or, or rock, you know. And and yeah, the the integration, the different ethnicities and and genders, we're we've actually fallen into that. Uh, not I, not really intentionally, but now we have. Uh, you know, different ethnicities represented in our band. We have, we have a, a female sax player that I'm really excited about it, who is British. It's somebody, I told somebody that yesterday. I said, you got to give her a mic. So just at some point during the show, she can talk to the audience. Right, right. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm not above <laughs> using that. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. But Barry, you, that's the whole thing is that, 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 that mantle didn't get carried on, right? People didn't carry it forward. And, and, you know, you did. And, and that's to your great credit, even if it fell in by accident, because the band is always the sum of the parts. And, you know, there are, it's, and again, it's about the song. I, I, I had this discussion on Friday with someone, there was a, just a whole thing with band and, and, you know, parents, you know, this is the, the contests have skewed our vision uh, of, yes. of how the music business works. Uh, I know we had to get to that. Um, it's on my list uh, mentally at all times to get in. The contests have so skewered how we look at the music business. That person does a great cover. Yeah. Great. It's a cover. Do we, do I need to explain that covers don't earn us anything in the music business, except maybe we sell a sound recording and then all the monies to support yourself are going to the, publisher and the writer of the song they're not always the same and you know the clip this to is clarify you're, you're referring to tv shows like the voice american idol oh yes. yeah I'm sorry. If I, if I, if I'm being uh, oblique i'm sorry but um the uh the the show there, there was the very first show on television it was right 95 was called star search oh, yeah. you remember Absolutely. it you did your thing, right? You picked and you choose whatever it was. You did your thing. Um, and um, famous artists we represent now won that, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, she did. Yeah, that's true. And 
that's how we met. That's this famous artist. That's how we met. Um, yes, still working with her. Um, but the shows now, when I'm talking to the parents, grandparents, who name it, you know, the, sometimes before all this crazy stuff of the last year occurred, I'd be in my conference room at my office and my writing wall and I'm up there, you know, making my notes and trying to explain things. I've got eight people with a, with a 14 or 13 or 14 year old boy or girl. And I'm trying, and they're saying, isn't Janie or Johnny a genius? And I would say, Janie and Johnny don't write songs. Yeah. yeah. It, it drives me crazy and, when, whenever they, cause even the judges will refer to these singers as artists, you know, Oh, I'm trying to figure out what kind of artist you're going to be. And I'm like, they're not an artist. They're a singer. There's a difference. And like you said, they're doing the covers. And you mentioned earlier about the, the overnight success kind of thing. And that's, and that feeds that overnight success. And the truth is it's not even that anymore. It, it, it was Nothing. in the earlier days. I mean, we can, certainly cannot argue that Kelly Clarkson and, and, and some of those are artists have two, two people who made it through. They were artists. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up what you said. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's, it's exactly right. We have like three people who have established careers from those shows. And we've got, you know, maybe hundreds who are, you know, by the wayside thinking it was their vehicle. Right. And who literally ran out of gas um, on the side of the road. This is, you know, for the entertainment attorney, people love, like to say, I talk to those people every week and I have for about 12 plus years. And, you know, when people say Janie, Johnny, Janie, Johnny, how do I protect Janie, Johnny? This is, here comes to the copyright stuff. And I would say, who are we, who are we protecting them from? And, and what are we protecting them with? What do we, what do you, what do you mean? They don't write songs. This is real world stuff. So recently 14 year old, uh, gal on the phone with me and her parents and, um, so I've got I've got uh, four parents because I've got the you know divorce. Yeah. So I got yeah. four parents talking to me, and I've got the fourteen year old, uh, and the fourteen year old is contest, and you know she's made a round or two. She's on only covers. Um, I looked at her YouTube videos. She's been watched by a thousand people. Um, the parents want a major record deal. They're about to pay a producer. They're well, well off. Here comes the hustle. They're about to pay a producer who had one hit in the 90s. Um, they're about to pay him 10, 10K a cut. He's writing. They're paying him to produce and to write, to write with her. And that's going to come out by the time they're done with this, about 200K plus to make an album. When I say that is major record deal budget. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I would never be paying that now because everybody doesn't need to spend that. We have we stopped spending that money eight, 10 years ago. They are without any context of my conversation. And so their reaction to me, and that maybe they'll be hearing this, is maybe we should talk to someone else. I don't know. He, I don't think he likes Janie. I don't think he's the guy. I don't know what's the problem here. He seems to kind of be negative about me. And I am desperate to say, do you want... And I talked to her directly, like I'm talking to you. And I said, Janie, you, you're 14 years old. Are you sure that this is what you want to do for the rest of your life? Because I think you should go to college. I think you should finish high school and go to college. And I think you should be playing and writing songs and develop the craft. And, you know, I got two parents going, okay, we like that. Go to college, get an education. That's great. And I said, by the way, don't spend a lot of money. Uh, in college, go, go to a place that, you know, more, a lot of debt, but, um, and then I had the two parents go, no, sh no, now, no, she gets, she has to now. And what, who's, who's that for? Is it for her or for them? And that's why the contests spin these almost impossibly dense, difficult moments. And I deal with it all week, every week for years. Um, and I'll be just blunt Sometimes when I talk to the families, I'm so blunt about it when I say she, she or he needs to write. And then they, here it comes. How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's 
Lyrics half, music half. All right, at least write lyrics. You want to talk about breaking up with your boyfriend at 15? Do it. But if you're getting lyrics about breaking up with your boyfriend from a 55-year-old producer, man, you've got a problem. I don't want to hear what that guy's got to say about that, right? <laughs> he broke up with his girlfriend, you know, somewhere in the 70s. I'm talking about you. What do you feel? And then when they say, okay, that's great. And then I have to teach them about music publishing. Okay, we'll get there. But how do we do that? And I say, here's your phone. It has GarageBand. Yeah. Right? Here it is. Go record something. And they just, oh, okay. So they're going to spend $25,000. I don't want to spend. You're a phone. Go put a demo together. And it is, that's, you can sense my heightened moment of, of you know, head to explode soon thing. It's every day. The contests have absolutely skewered the view of the business. And it's it's almost, I was, uh, uh, this is true. I was eighth place, not me. The artist is eighth place in some contest. Mm -hmm. That's a participation medal. Yeah. That's not, you're not an artist, as you said. You're developing, but you got a medal for being in eighth place. When you win, You've still got to prove yourself, but you didn't win. Someone liked you and you got some views. Play me your best song. Yeah. I'm still waiting on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what, you've been very generous with your time. We've been on for almost 90 minutes, including the chit chat prior to this. So we probably, because <laughs> we're both base, basis, we probably didn't mention that. Um, so we could talk shop and I even had to cut that conversation short because I could see where that was going to go for a long, long time. So, uh, Ron, thank you so much for your, your very generous amount of time today. And, uh, would love to do it again. Maybe go off on a different tangent if you're be down with that, but, um, anytime Barry, it's always a pleasure to talk okay, to you. You too. Have a wonderful, uh, rest of your week and we will talk again soon. Thank you. Very good. Be safe out there. Thanks, Barry. Pleasure.